Hello. Everyone hear me okay? Hi, I'm Debbie Anderson. Um, I teach English. If I don't know you, I know about half the people in the room, I think. Half, um, hello. Um, <clears throat> I'm also involved with the Commonwealth Honors Program, which uh, has a great event planned for you today. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you Joseph Salvatore. Uh, Joe is a Massachusetts native, born and raised in Brockton, but he comes here today from New York City. Uh, I'm fortunate to not only be a fan of Joe's work, but also to be a friend and former classmate of his. Joe and I met uh, over 15 years ago. I don't think we need to say how many years over 15 years ago. Uh, we met at Salem State College, now Salem State University, um, in a master's degree program in English. Uh, we met in a fiction writing workshop, uh, which we were just chatting about in the car. And um, <clears throat> I knew right away when I met Joe that he was a risk taker in terms of his writing and in terms of what he was willing to try his hand at. I saw him work at writing poetry, nonfiction, different genres of fiction. I saw him perform poetry. I saw him put on many readings. I saw him um, act in plays. Basically do anything that he could to immerse himself in the experience of being a writer and in the world of writers. Um, <clears throat> Joe left uh, Salem and went off to New York City where he did a master's in fine arts after his master's in English uh, at the New School. At the New School, he continued to develop himself as a writer and as a teacher of writing. And um, <clears throat> so today, he's an award-winning faculty member uh, of the New School, as well as an author of uh, the collection To Assume a Pleasing Shape. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you Joe Salvatore. Uh, thanks, Deb, for that wonderful introduction. I really appreciate it. It was. It's. Um, I don't know if uh, some of you folks want to go on to study writing, but it's a pleasure to um, be here and have my friend Deb have invited me here. Uh, she just talked about our history, so it's a real treat to be here, and I'm really grateful to the faculty members and the students who are here today um, for for coming and supporting this event. And I really want to thank Tom Grady and the Commonwealth Honors Program for inviting me for to this and for sponsoring it. I'm really grateful. Um, so what I'm going to do is read two stories. One's a little shorter than the other. Um, and I think they'll give you a flavor for the different sort of uh, styles that I'm trying to work at in my fiction lately. Um, and then I'm really looking forward to hearing if there's any questions from you folks and having a conversation, if that's something you'd be interested in. Happy to answer any questions at all about the writing process or anything you really want to ask me. I'm really happy to answer. So um, <clears throat> that said, I have a little bit of a cold, so I'm going to try to not annoy you with some of this throat clearing. Um, is this my water in all honesty? OK, great. Um, so uh, the first story I'm going to read is a story called Late Thaw. Who thinks these things as you eat a peanut butter sandwich and your wife is lacing up her Nikes in the kitchen and warning you to go slow with the bread and asking you to stay put because she has a job for you in about one second you're going to hold her left ankle and lift it incrementally as she lets unstiffen her hamstring and breathes deeply and bunches her brow and puts all her weight in your hands and says she's going to take advantage of her day off and greater advantage still of the weather because no one's going to be running in the park on a day like this, overcast and cold and two days before Thanksgiving, no strollers, no bikes, and won't she be thus utterly allowed to give herself over to it, let herself go, run without thought as she did as a girl on the beaches of Cape Cod. <clears throat> That place she took you to after only two months of dating to meet her family because she said without any sentimentality at all because that is not her style. Just said it like she might be giving someone the time that she wants you to meet her father before he dies because he's dying, she told you, and then never mentioned it again. 
And she drives you in another November from New York to Massachusetts in her old white Subaru with no working heat. And you play the only cassette tape she has in the car, which is the B-52's Cosmic Thing. And you thrill at the slate gray planks of water miles, it seems, below you as you cross the Sagamore Bridge and then continue down old Route 6 past houses with unpainted clapboards and scrub brush and white pine until she takes some turns and then some more and then swings the Subaru into a driveway made of beach sand and parks in front of an open, empty garage, but not inside the garage. And a big, rusty, blonde dog comes ambling out of the house. And although strange dogs scare you, you nonetheless put your hand out for sniff inspection. And your soon-to-be, though you don't know it yet wife, drops to her knees and lets go her backpack and puts her mittened hands out and says, Rexford, Come here, Rexford. And a woman with short, neatly combed white hair comes onto the porch wearing a faded denim shirt over a dark turtleneck and says to you, well, hello there. And to your girlfriend says, if you want to park in the garage, that's fine because Roberta's left for the day. And you shake hands with a white-haired woman who tells you to call her Ellen. And then around your legs and into the house runs the dog before you even make it to the steps. And inside on a couch under a patch quilt and comforter is a man with no hair and breathtakingly thin. And his name is Mike. And Mike doesn't stand to shake hands, but does nonetheless offer you his hand to shake. And his hand feels dry and cool and hollow as a bird, but is bumpy with calluses. And later after dinner, when your future wife and her mother are washing dishes, he says to you something that could if you allowed it to sound to your graduate school ears like something worthy of critical ridicule, but that later upon reflection under the circumstances sounds to you not merely non-sentimental, but utterly heroic, life-affirming, real, is delivered, in fact, as if he were just giving someone the time. He says, my daughter likes you, and I may not get to see her get married, but she likes you, and so what the hell, I'll say it to you. If you should end up with her, please take good care of her. I'm supposed to say that, right? Well, you probably already picked, on this, picked up on this, but she's a tough girl. Believe me, I know, she won't always let you know what she's thinking, and she'll keep you out of her life sometimes, even when you don't understand why she would feel she couldn't trust someone who loves her as much as you do. Believe me, I know, take it from me, he says. She's a tough one, but she's an honest girl. Once saw her from a doorway when she never knew I was watching, stand on her bare toes trying to reach a book off a shelf and knock over one of them boats in a bottle that my father had made me. He had dozens of those pieces of shit. Anyway, it hit the side of the dresser and scattered in shards around her bare feet. And I stepped back quick knowing she'd hate that I'd seen her, but she didn't see me and so I figured I'd better keep my mouth shut. Just crept down the stairs and headed out to check my lobster traps because I didn't want any trouble from that girl. Nope. Learned my lesson early, and listen to me here. One wrong move, one wagged finger with that one, and she'll be silent for days. Better to keep the peace than rail about an old bottle, I figured. But then later that night, Ellen told me that our girl had been brooding all day, quiet and slouchy, kind of food fickle, passed up a hoodsy cup her mother had offered her. But then finally, before bed, had confided in her mother that she had broken the boat in the bottle that Grandpa had given Daddy, and that on her own, she'd cleaned up the floor and saved all the pieces in a brown paper bag. And then she lifted her bare feet, and my wife saw what some of that brooding had been about, and told our daughter to stay put while she fetched the mercuricone. And, ah, oh, hell, I got a million stories about how she made me proud that I was saving for someday to tell her, like maybe on her wedding day, that's what we're supposed to do, right? Fathers and daughters. But I guess that is the way life finally does go. I'm sure I'm not telling you nothing new, nothing you don't already think about, but it's worth repeating, I think. You better do some things while you are still able, because one day you might not have that chance again. <clears throat> and that was all Mike had wanted to say to you. And that night, Mike and Ellen let you and their daughter sleep premaritally in her old bedroom. And when, in the dark, her back in your belly, you told her the story that Mike had told you, you felt her face and it was wet. And the next morning, you woke alone. And downstairs, Ellen was sitting with Mike and a woman dressed in white who said her name was Roberta. And Ellen said that their daughter had gone for a run on the beach and that you should pour yourself a cup of coffee in the kitchen. And by the time your cup was full, the back door swung open and in with the cold air she came 
pulling off hat and mittens and said, God, how good that felt, had the beach all to herself. And two days later, you were back in Brooklyn, and sometimes you would look out the window of your apartment out onto North 3rd Street, thinking about how he had lived long enough to know that she was engaged, but not long enough to see her get married. And how his voice was hard to hear, and he didn't say much over the phone when you called to ask his permission. And okay, maybe that was too schmaltzy, and maybe you rushed things a bit because of the talk you and Mike had had, but you never cared or believed you made the wrong decision because she was a tough girl, and she told the truth, and maybe she hid herself away sometimes, but she always came back. Except from the park. Because who thinks these things? That while your wife is lacing up her Nikes and you're eating a sandwich made from the bread you were supposed to use for the stuffing for a turkey that will sit in your freezer frozen for seven months until you finally throw it out? Because you couldn't until now? Because it was she who had touched it last? She who had brought it home a week before her run and cleared out the freezer shelf and pushed the frozen bird in? And who thinks these things that while all this is happening, a man who lives a state and a river away, and who has driven many times through and has studied the landscape of the same park your wife will jog through that very afternoon, will also take advantage of a day when the visibility is low and the chance of many people being in the park slim. And who thinks these things, that this man would use nylon rope that could so easily be traced back to a Home Depot in New Jersey? And that he would, with that nylon rope, make your wife to lie cold in the dirt at the bottom of a slope by the side of a path where no one would find her until after midnight. In fact, not a no one, but a dog. A dog would find her, running shorts first, and then the rest of her later. And who thinks these things, that her legs, that you had helped stretch just hours before, would be cold to the touch, and so would the feet. And who thinks about these things so much, about if her white and purple running sneakers were on or off those feet? And who thinks these things that this man from across the river would feel convinced that he had studied everything as well as he could, thought of all possible outcomes, but that he would never know that the person he had selected had once, long ago, in a room where you could always smell the sea, broken a bottle with a boat in it, and that those glass shards when her father had turned his back, cut their way into her bare feet. And who thinks these things, that those small scars that you had touched and traced and kissed might have gleamed for just a moment in the beam of a searching flashlight? Who thinks these things, you wonder, staring out onto North Third Street? Who would think such things, and for how much longer? So that's a story called Late Thaw, and I'm going to read um, one other story and then turn it over to you guys. Um, <clears throat> this story is um, called, I'm just not sure if I should say anything about this story or just read it. Um, this story is actually going to be coming out in a, an anthology from Norton. Um, on something called fraudulent artifacts. The anthology is called Fakes. And I actually just did a panel recently at a, a creative writing conference where we presented the book and talked about the different um, inclusions. And my, this story is a story that sort of came out of uh, a sort of geometric problem that I was looking at where you have these kinds of like language, th language sort of in, uh, prompts like if someone's leaving Los Angeles at midnight and someone's leaving New York at two, who will get there first and this kind of thing. And I thought, well, could a story be kind of found within such a text? But it doesn't seem much like that now after 80,000 revisions, but this is it. Anyway, it's called Practice Problem. <clears throat> Circles overlapping circles, circles intersecting with other circles, like the slow closing interstice of moon crossing over soon to be eclipsed sun. Circles overlapping with small shaded areas of geometry, not the geometry of Lobachevsky or Gauss or Euclid, but the geometry of Jennifer, the geometry of Jennifer Hampton, small boned, green eyed, pale faced goth girl, theater major at the State College in Salem, Massachusetts. A woman's studies minor currently on academic probation for the fall semester of 1995 for failing introduction to geometry last spring. A writer of poetry and nude dancer 
at Shelby's Slink Factory on Route 1, where Jennifer sticks out her pierced tongue and makes contact with her pierced nipple raised by hand up to her black lipsticked mouth. Jennifer. Jennifer Hampton, the geometry thereof in those circles, overlapping circles, circles like her silver sunglasses, the ones she wears day and night, indoors and out. Circles like her many pills, the ones that deter pregnancy and manic depression, social anxiety disorder and panic attacks, OCD, ADHD, and PTSD. Circles like the sunbeam clock above the dish-filled sink, the clock that hasn't worked since 4.48 on a day when it seemed time finally slowed to a stop. Circles like the antique opal ring that Terry gave her. And then there's Terry. Big boned Boston bouncer at Club Zero Hour, located behind the Fenway. The hearty Irish shaved redheaded overseer of the cage dance bar crowd that he's paid to control with their wiry bangled arms and pythonic nylon skinned legs sprouting from combat boots and silver platforms. And look, there's Terry now, tight black t-shirt, hard body, jeans and silver tip boots, shaking down the clientele, running hands up thighs over asses and groins, searching for nines and box cutters and any other shit the grungy flannel shirted boys and lately the girls try to get past. The geometry of Terry, the geometry of Jennifer, Jennifer Hampton, intersecting planes and lines and overlapping circles and then we turn to our assignment. Graph the total area and spatial solidity and utter leather morosis of Jennifer Hampton on a solid three-dimensional plane. Note, be sure to make use of the fifth axiom and point P. And to begin the assignment, we use a blank sheet of paper, blank slate, start clean, pen and pencil, and we wager softly on the depending outcomes of logistical circumstance, positive relativism, apathia. We allow to coincide the Sunday morning that Big Bone Terry Hogan woke up in Laura Huron's four-poster canopy bed, the brittle condom still biting around his flaccid manhood, his head a crescendo of constricting blood vessels. And at that same moment, Jennifer Hampton pouring her morning urine into a clear chemical solution and then over the colored cardboard dipstick embossed with two tiny indicator circles, one pink, the other white, almost simultaneously swallowing three pregnancy-deterring circles, trying to make up for the three she missed last month. After spending a Friday, Saturday, Sunday biking from Roxbury to Cape Cod with Miguel. But her son being clock above the dishfield sink doesn't tell time anymore, and Jennifer sends a letter to Roxbury, to Miguel in Roxbury. Miguel from Roxbury. Now the slim-hipped hairdresser on Newberry Street. By and beautiful. Sideburns cut like coke. And the letter starts politely, calmly. Hey there, stranger. Then a few lines later, can you believe this is happening to me? I'm getting it done next week. Hope I don't get shot by someone wearing a Save a Fetus for Jesus pin. Because I'm going to have to slow down. I haven't used my brakes in so long. Hope they still catch. Would love to hear from you. Where you been? Love, Jennifer. And if the sunbeam clock about the dishfield sink had still worked, she'd have known that it was 229 hours since she walked downtown to the corner of Derby and Congress and pulled the lip and fed the mouth of the mailbox a pink envelope addressed to Miguel de la Cruz of Humboldt Avenue in Roxbury, Massachusetts, who, at the exact moment when the mouth of the mailbox was being pulled by Jennifer's small, many ring, black fingernailed hand, was asking another woman, this one even smaller bone than Jennifer, but almost the same age, actually 14 months younger, but he, Miguel, never asks, only hopes, to accompany him on a trip from Roxbury to Cape Cod. He says it'll be the best exercise she'll ever enjoy getting and touches her arm on the very same spot where he touched Jennifer's for that crucial second longer than is necessary. And his pouty, tight lips will finally spread east to west. And this girl, Veronica, 14 months younger than Jennifer, Veronica Sheldon, a transplanted District of Columbian will remember how her ex, Brian, Brian of South Boston, with his leprechaun tattooed shoulder, promised her romantic trips, like the one she'll take with Miguel, down to the Cape, or to Walden Pond, or Revere Beach, or somewhere, anywhere, just as long as she wouldn't leave him, or cheat on him, or look at other guys. 
and how his promises for romantic getaways became intertextured with his promises to stop drinking until that Friday night last December when he opened up the side of her face, his diamond clatter ringed fist catching her just below the cheekbone. And now that pinkish purple worm crawls across her cheek forever, but Miguel said she was beautiful, and that's more than anyone else ever said to Veronica Sheldon. And Jennifer's clock has hands that don't move, and Jennifer's addressee, Miguel, will pedal next to Veronica Sheldon. The two of them will cross the Bourne Bridge together and not see passing them, intersecting their radii, the smoky green sob of the doctor who first looked at Veronica's cheek the night Brian's fist left its mark. And Dr. Powers, will speed his sob from Howardsport back to Boston, a smoky green line segment darting from the center point of his world toward the circumference of another, speeding back to Boston, back to Beacon Hill, to give his daughter's college dorm mate, Emma, 27 years his junior, a gold tennis bracelet and dinner in the North End. And up on the fourth floor, in an apartment across the street from the restaurant, across the street from Giovanni's, where Dr. Powers and Emma are planning the duplicities of their delicate new union. Up on the fourth floor, Leslie and Karen are stoned and 69ing. And Leslie moves her tongue in empty circles between Karen's labia majora, wishing Jennifer Hampton would just return her phone calls. But Leslie knows that Jennifer only sees the night they slept together after Club Zero Hour, the night Leslie had to spend an hour and a half to get her astro-glided fist wrist deep inside Jennifer. Leslie knows that Jennifer Hampton only sees their night together as her obligatory college feminist foray into the trendy lesbianism that's been written about so much lately, so much lately in The Phoenix and The Voice. Leslie knows that small bone, green-eyed Jennifer Hampton, with her witchy pentagram tattoo on her slim Salem ankle, only wanted to piss off her ugly, shaven-headed, control freak, total breeder, bouncer boyfriend because he puts his hands way too far up women's skirts when he's working the door. Leslie knows that Jennifer is one of those total breeder girls who desperately want to be bi, you know, really bi, like beautiful Miguel, whom Leslie introduced to Jennifer in Boston the day they were having double espressos and rolling drum cigarettes sitting on Newbury Street at the Armani Sidewalk Cafe. And Leslie knows that Miguel took one look at Jennifer's sad green eyes and her all-too-ripe 20-year-old body and thought, mmm, definite bike trip to the Cape. And to be honest, Leslie doesn't even believe Miguel is really bi, since for as long as she's known him, he's never gone biking down the Cape with anyone but beautiful young girls. And as for beautiful young girls, Leslie also knows that Jennifer blew her off that next night at Club Zero Hour so she could make her bouncer boyfriend jealous again. But this time with Miguel, not some dyke from the North End. Just return my fucking calls, bitch. And although a non-subscriber to phallocentrism, Leslie will use a jello red dildo on Karen whose legs will be tied too far apart so that later, when she is untied and gets up to use the bathroom, she, Karen, will walk stiff and grimace like an old woman with arthritis while in Salem, Massachusetts, the city where broom-straddling witches decorate refrigerator door magnets and the sides of police cars. In Salem, Massachusetts, Jennifer Hampton places a Nine Inch Nails CD into her Sony Discman the silver circle refracting in her tobacco-stained fingers, and she won't remember that she was supposed to return one of Bulldike Leslie's two dozen manic messages. She's such a drama queen. She'll be rehearsing some new dance steps for the beer-glazed, tear-glazed eyes at Shelby Slink Factory in front of her oak-framed mirror that she found in Marblehead in someone's trash. She will be thinking about Miguel and the baby that never was, and she will roll a tight drum cigarette and take a walk and think and write Miguel another letter. And she will see the October moon fat and round in the grape Zarek sky. And this will invigorate her, make her feel consumed with a belief in fate, a belief that everything happens for a reason under that great glowing green cheese celestial sphere. And who says it's not the eye of the goddess, our mother in the night? able to pull the oceans away from the sands and up into the stars? Who says it's not all going to work out in the end? Who, other than Jennifer, after all, can control her own fate? And that's when Jennifer will see Anthony. Anthony the painter, Anthony the artist, who uses hollow core bathroom doors in place of canvases and who stacks them down the cellar of his apartment building where his landlord, one Raymond Calabrazio, will throw them out next week since he's been vowing to do so for, to his wife, Sophia, who had her breasts enlarged 
and her nose jobbed last year, and who, while during her stay in Salem Hospital, saw the smoky green sob Dr. Powers walk past her room every so often, and although she never met him, she considered him a very attractive older gentleman. But right now, here's Anthony the painter, Anthony the artist whose daytime job is bike courier, and who delivered a white package last week to a man named Jules in Jamaica Plain for $300. But Anthony didn't ask any questions, just delivered a package is all. A portion of which got cut up and split in half and distributed to a young dealer, Jason Barnard who sold a portion of his portion to a queer named Miguel, who works in some hair salon where Jason's other customer, Karen Del Maro, works. Karen, who lives with her girlfriend Leslie in the north end across the street and four floors up from Giovanni's restaurant, the present locus of love and linguine for Dr. Powers. But right now, to the north of that spatio-temporal amorous cabal, right now here comes Anthony the painter, Anthony the artist, coming right now toward Jennifer, walking slowly, left hand in pocket, in the right, a cigarette glowing like a lit fuse, coming toward Jennifer Hampton from the direction of the college, scraps of fallen leaves skittering between the closing chasms of their collective steps and mutual paths, and Jennifer will look down, avert her gaze as Anthony passes. She will see the dim splatters of paint on his black Doc Martens, and she will turn back as he passes, but not say a word after seeing that he had cut his ponytail off. And Jennifer will keep walking, as will Anthony, two integers, units of measure, unknown values and variables, maybe positive, maybe negative, void now to extrapolation, moving in, an opposite, moving in opposite directions on a given line, distance compounding with every step, no backward glances now. And Jennifer will walk on until she ends up at the college, the building's black this time of night, and across the street she will step into the college pizza shop, which is actually called College Pizza and Sub, still open, thank goddess. And Jennifer will order a slice of pepperoni and a small coffee and sit at a brown Formica table and pull out her pouch and roll another cigarette, looking at her reflection to the left in the darkened front window of the shop and begin to conceive another letter to Miguel. And that's when she will see Anthony, pony tailless, his paint speckled docks glowing extraterrestrially in the neon light. And Anthony will enter and stare up at the posted food prices as run his hand through his hair and feel around for the amputated limb of ponytail and then realize and remember and reach farther down as if to scratch the back of his neck. And he will pretend not to notice Jennifer Hampton, who at the same time is pretending not to notice Anthony, acting all preoccupied and getting her cigarette to roll just right, head bent down, fingers working the white paper into a fat, soon-to-be-delicious smoke. And Anthony will make his order, a small onion and mushroom, please. Oh, and hey, throw in a can of Diet Coke with that, all right? And the man behind the counter, <clears throat> wearing a stained apron, will bark back in broken English, small pizza pie? And Anthony will say, no, no pie, thanks, just the pizza, to which the man behind the counter, head down now like Jennifer's, already spreading the toppings over the tomato pasted dough, tossing the onions and mushrooms out like a dealer at a blackjack table, will say, oh yeah, oh yeah, okay, small piece of pie for you. And Anthony will smile nervously and turn back to get a reality check response from Jennifer, whose head is still down, like the man behind the counter, the man behind the counter, whose wife, Marta, is kneeling in front of a candle-lit religious shrine across town, her head down at that very moment, just like her husband's, just like Jennifer Hampton's. Three heads all bend down at that very moment, three points of a triangle spreading out across the city, and Marta's head at one vertex bent down in prayer now, praying for her husband's fingers to get cut off in the salami slicer. And Marta, emotionally exhausted from working the late shift at the pizza shop after her husband, the man behind the counter, begins his affair with a chubby college freshman named Nicole. Marta will imagine one great day shooting and killing her husband, shooting him in the face, his head broken op open and spilling over like a fabulous pinata, syrupy colors running all over the floor of the pizza shop, college pizza and sub, that is. Colors everywhere, on the tops of police cars and ambulances, on the walls and on the cash register, and if Marta's lucky that night, on the blouse of that puta Nicole. Colors running out of her husband's open head, like the vibrant paints Anthony had used on those hollow cord bathroom doors, those doors which by that time, thanks to Raymond Calabrazio, will be forgotten in some dump, buried under a card table once belonging to the poet Lucy Brock Broido. But Marta won't know any of this won't know poets or paints, 
won't know guns or gun dealers, won't even know Jason Barnard, <clears throat> who could hook her up with a fi any firearm she desired just by making a phone call to the pager of a West Indian called Toby. But Marta won't know the right equation for tracking Jason Barnard down. And soon Jennifer will be back with Big Bone Terry after spending two and a half artistic months with Anthony the painter, Anthony the artist. But right now, here's Anthony sitting across from small bone white faced Jennifer Hampton, who is chipping bits of black polish off her fingernails, her head still down, a black pen lying across an open notebook. And Anthony will follow her disinterested lead and look down at her own hand, at the gray sprinkles of paint on his knuckles, and then over at Jennifer. Hey, weren't you in my figure drawing class, he'll say? And Jennifer will snap her head up and with the thespionic acumen of De Niro, feign surprise. Excuse me, she'll say, plucked brows arched but eyes lidded with apathy. And Anthony will explain that he was uh, mistaken, he thinks maybe, but he's sure he's seen her around, uh, maybe in Boston. And Jennifer will mention Club Zero Hour and how this guy, she's um, kind of like seeing but not for much longer, is a doorman there. And Anthony will ask for some of her tobacco, getting up and joining her at her table in an unspoken gesture that communicates his gallant refusal to let her reach across the fluorescently soaked garlicly odoriferous pizza shop. And she will ask him what happened to his ponytail, and he'll say he had a job interview, and like he was getting like totally sick of it anyway. Besides, everyone has one now, even the assholes. And Jennifer will agree and smile, flashing the silver bar in her tongue. And Anthony will smile back, and they will eat pizza and drink coffee, smoke cigarettes, and, breathe, and be sweetly ignorant, like two people who are about to fuck for the first time often are. And for the next 82 days, Big Bone Terry will join Leslie and the legion of other phone callers whose messages Jennifer won't return. And Terry will call Miranda Kaiser from Swampscott, who wears a jobs, not jails, pin on the front of her backpack and who volunteers planting trees in a small playground in Roxbury, two streets over from Humboldt Avenue. And in the next 82 days, Terry will give Miranda 13 orgasms, two dozen roses, and one case of herpes simplex 2. A disease miraculously not transmitted to Jennifer Hampton, the contagion's progress halted, canceled out on her side of the supposition. Her graft placement inside the text of this assignment, this geometric assignment, this practice problem that asked us to graph the total area of Jennifer Hampton, plotting points like the naming of already dead stars. And when the pizza crusts lie splayed upon the silver tray and the fat October green cheese moon glows outside the dark shop windows and Jennifer Hampton swallows two small circles down with her last sip of coffee and crumples another aborted letter to Miguel, dropping it into the butt-filled ashtray, the man behind the counter will clear his throat and say, we closing, we closing, and Jennifer and Anthony will stand and stretch and then leave in search of latex circles and more cigarettes. Anthony, hoping his, room, his roommate Hal isn't still up watching the Playboy channel, the smell of sperm permeating the paneled room, discarded Kleenex by his feet. And Jennifer will hope Anthony is not in an orally generous mood tonight since she hasn't showered since this morning and wax since last week, and the outline of Jennifer and Anthony will darken and then disappear into the tree-lined expanse of Lafayette Street. And the man behind the counter will move in front of the counter and clear their table, wiping it with a rag in broad, muscular circles, repeating the words again to himself, we closing, we closing, we closing. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, some of that was some strong language. I'd forgotten about that. Sorry. Um, so I would be really happy to answer any questions if anybody has anything. Yeah. Um, I, first and foremost, I enjoyed those stories. Excellent. Thanks, Tom. Um, the, I wanted to know about your writing process a little bit. More specifically, I think your, your characters and your setting is so descriptive. Do you, do you start with that? and let that lead your story, or how do you go about thinking up this story? Where do you start from? That's a great question, and with some insight into that process, yeah. If any of you are working on your own stuff, you know sometimes it's a lucky accident, it's a scrap of dialogue, or it's some few sentences you happen to write that seem to click, whether the, des the descriptions were there or they were just coming easily. Um, so in general, the process is like, you know, putting together a book was a much more arduous process for me than 
being in workshops and being in classes. As a, as a teacher, I don't have a lot of time to write as much as I used to. And so I actually took a sabbatical and was able to go away. And I actually came back to Brockton and lived with my mother at the time. I just didn't want to be around anybody. And so I had to really find a schedule and a process that worked. And I realized that beyond talent or beyond like great stories or art coming together, the only thing I wanted to focus on to keep, san to keep my sanity was process. I kept thinking, I want to write a certain amount of words every day. Um, and once I hit that number of fresh composition, then I could do whatever I wanted to do. And I, at that time, because I was on my sabbatical, I would be reading when I wasn't writing. And, but in general, so when you have something like that, it's really hard to uh, plan where the inspiration is going to come from. I, when I first start to write in the morning, I'll sort of look at what I've done before and start to work from there. And hopefully I have something going. But if it's a blank page day, there it's something either I've pulled from a journal, something I remember, some, little, some thought I've had. And I, I don't mean to sort of fetishize my own process, but from what I've heard from a lot of my writer friends, it sort of works the same way. You kind of grasp for some, some little bit that you can start from. Fill up at least a page with some words and you have something to go on. Generally for me, it's the language um, that I'm really interested in. Not for the sake of pure style, but I like the way language sort of maps on to say not only the diction of my characters, but their sort of thought process, the way they think. Not stream of consciousness so much. This is going to sound really precious now. Not stream of consciousness so much, but just the way interiority gets captured in fiction in a way that no other form of narrative drama that I can think of actually captures, which is why I love fiction, that deep interiority. And I love the way language can kind of come close to approximating it and all the little tricks you can do with sentences and stuff. So once I start playing with that, I start to get a feel for who the character is a little bit. Her ticks, her digressions, the way she's not going to talk about what really is going on, or the way he's going to avoid the subject, or the way he actually really wants to tell this story, but is going to tell you another story. And I try to trust that for that day's writing, and go with it and see where it goes. Ultimately, my real sort of process advice or instinct is to say, I'm just interested in building like a huge amount of what clay, so that at some point I have such a mass that I can then go back in, cut out what doesn't need to be there, forgive the obvious, and then find the story in there, and then really get to work on shaping it and making it sort of what I need it to be. So both of the stories I read today are examples of that. I mean, they were really raw and weird and very different when I started. Practice Problem was actually a, 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 a slam poem when it first started. And it wasn't even a math problem. It was more, it was just a poem that was going to kind of overwhelm the listeners with the amount of uh, repeated patterns in a relation, romantic relationships that this character had. She kept kind of dating the same people. But once the math thing came, I, it was no longer, I didn't want it to be a poem anymore, and it started, and that's when I was working on fiction and sort of trying to build that up. But it really did go through, like, I swear to you, maybe 50 drafts. I mean, I'm not kidding. A lot, a lot of cutting and cutting, and even as I was cutting it ready for the book. So that's sort of a little bit of the beginning to the end of a process that I can describe. Good question. Yeah. I'm kind of kind of feeling that it's like an inner monologue that some guy is basically going. It's like the way of your, your human brain kind of thinks. You know what I mean? You're just like kind of flowing the way that person is thinking about his own situation. But so I'm thinking, and it was so personal and like the details. So I'm thinking, there's no way there isn't some real life inspiration behind this. And then I heard the second story. And I was like, this guy just created. It was like a Quentin Tarantino movie. Like a million, you know what I mean? so, so that kind of blew that. Out. So I'm just, I'm just I know obviously you have the ability to create all these all these you know dynamic characters, but my question is there's nothing you can you can read a lot about things, but it, at some point it has to draw from some sort of like per you know, you you're right associate the characters that you come out with with maybe even if it's not a, a person but a relationship between people, something like that. I was just wondering if how you draw from real life experience to, to put that into that. Absolutely. It kind of builds off a little bit of the qu the question I just answered, like Anything that will start to feed that day's writing is, is something I'm going to take. A couple of quick examples. The, 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 a lot of that stuff I do steal from my life, from people I've known or stories I've heard. So for instance, the, I knew a guy when I was living in Salem who used to do artwork, graffiti art, on the hoods of old cars that he would take from the, 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 the car dump lot, whatever it's called. I'm inarticulate now. Um, he had all these... Uh, 
car hoods with graffiti on them, and they were kind of cool. They were okay. But at the same time, there was a de Kooning exhibit at the, at the um, what is it here? And it's not MoMA, it's the Museum of Contemporary Art, I think. With the ICU, and um, ICA, sorry, I've been in New York too long. But anyway, I saw a de Kooning exhibit there. I think it was there. And there were some of his paintings that were on hollow core doors. And I was really, and I'd already had this guy with the hooded, the car hoods. But I didn't, for some reason, I just didn't like, and I couldn't see them stacked in a cellar, and, and I wanted them to have, a, I wanted the land. So, you know, I'm, so I was using some stuff that I knew. The, the late thaw piece came about while I was in Brockton. And while I was in Brockton on my sabbatical in 2007, I was, Brockton at that point, uh, my mother used to get the Brockton Enterprise delivered, and, and Brockton was the murder capital at that time of Massachusetts. And one night I was talking to a friend of mine who now lives in Spokane, Washington. We were on the phone, and I heard this tinkling happening, and I said, hey, hold on. And I looked out the window, and there was these people carrying like cymbals and, and, and maracas and all these other things with candles. And it was a candlelight vigil that was going down my street. I lived on North Montello Street, sort of in the center of Brockton. And, uh, they were outraged at, at the amount of murders that had happened, and so they were taking the streets, and they were trying to... Um, and that was the same time, that period was the same time when that story came over the news about this guy in Connecticut whose house, he had a home invasion, and there were these people that broke in and tied him up and, and killed his wife and daughters, and they set the house on fire, and it was a really horrendous thing. And at the time, the only thing I would do that was not staying in the house and reading and writing was I would go for a run in a park after my writing day at around four-ish or something like that. And my mother, who was like in her 80s at the time, was very concerned with everything that was going on in Brockton that I'd not get hurt in uh, DW Fields Park where I was running. And at some point when I was running, I just thought there was all these little areas and I'd see like, you know, just debris, but sometimes you'd see a, a shoe. And so with the violence that was sort of swirling around me, and my concern about my mother, she was concerned about me, but I was worried about going back to New York and leaving her in the city. I'd forgotten how violent Brockton was at that time. And um, that's so, so late thought came up. But no, I didn't have any sense of a character who, I didn't know anybody who'd lost a wife. Um, I had just ended a relationship, so, so maybe that was part of it. But anyway, good question. Absolutely, and I'm, I, uh, I really appreciate a question like that just because sometimes it is uh, really hard for me to get the exact kind of syntax that I want. This again, well, I guess because I'm in front of a microphone I can sound precious, but it does sound a little precious. But it, for me, that syntax is a really important part of the process for me. So, yeah, there are writers who use language in really interesting ways. Some of them are maximalist writers whose sentences are really huge, like, you know, I really love this guy who just died, David Foster Wallace. Um, I'm a really big fan of some of the work of Thomas Pynchon. Um, Crying of Lot 49 has these beautiful long sentences. Um, but then there's like other stylists who are a little bit quieter but can manage a sentence, like, like a writer named Lydia Davis. Uh, incredible writer <clears throat> whose sentence is so perfectly made and they don't seem to show off she can do she'll have stories that are one sentence long just because the story calls for it but you know if you're interested in this sort of stuff she's somebody who's so in control of her sentences and understands grammar she's a translator um, <clears throat> you know even even to some extent Gertrude Stein's strange syntactic experiments and uh, Hemingway's work and and then when you talk about Hemingway you talk about Faulkner and Wolf so these folks who were kind of work in the sentence were s people I'm always interested in whether it's really muscular, tight sentences that are, that are working in a particular way to build some kind of effect, or whether they're long sentences that are up to something other than just being long. So, those are some. Do you have any writers that you uh, like that work in this way? Huh? I like T.S. Eliot. Um, definitely, definitely. Sure. Well said. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's the sort of stuff I'm in, in, really, really interested in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
it's a generous question because I'm allowed to sort of say, you know, I could take, you know, you can sort of, it's hard, it's very convenient to remember it in a very artistic way. Um, I can tell you for sure that it's, it's uh, the, the, the line, who thinks these things, was the first line that started that story. I remember thinking that as I started to write that piece. Um, and then I was trying to think of how to get it sort of, how to dr dramatize it, how to get it into a time and place situation. And um, I did, I honestly can say to you, in answer, like, as I said to this other, I didn't really know it was gonna end in the way it did. I was more interested in sort of doing a domestic quieter piece because my pieces tend to be a little bit um, fiery and, and stuff. So I wanted something a little quieter about relationships. <clears throat> and I wanted to sort of pick, sort of give some backstory there. Once, once I got the, once I got the death thing, <clears throat> then I then I realized that it was going to be a piece about somebody thinking, I, why am I thinking these thoughts? And I and I really thought that the first person, <clears throat> one of the things I think about the second person, let me say this, <clears throat> is that the second person is actually interesting to me not because it's an unusual point of view, and Jay McInerney did it in an entire novel, but because I think particularly like in Jay McInerney's Bright Lights, Big City, which is entirely narrated in the second person, I feel like the second person is a really good way of avoiding things because if you are speaking in the second person um, and you're talking about you, you're implicating the listener or the reader. <clears throat> you're also talking about a kind of you that you're now making an object in a certain way. Um, and, you're, and by avoiding the first person, you can sort of generalize a bit or make aphorisms, and you can do this stuff with the second person that I think actually characterizes the character. But now, for what reason? And for this particular reason, and they thought I wanted there to be a deep sense of denial on his part. And the, the idea of the, even the title and stuff is just that he has not thawed from this trauma yet. It's only just beginning a little bit. And so the second person allowed him to sort of speak about a you that was himself, but not really confront it through the first person as much. So um, I definitely take point of view very seriously, and I really appreciate that question because, you know, there are many workshops where you know you'll be asked to write a story in second person and i think those are really useful exercises but sometimes if your intention isn't really if if the content isn't really serving that choice it can be a little bit it can not feel maybe as organic somehow so yeah thank you i know right I should have done that. <laughs> um, it was called, I won't even want to tell you some of the silly, I never know titles. I mean, I, I, I'm really bad with titles. <clears throat> Deb and I had a, a teacher that, um, who, this guy Rod Kessler, who was a wonderful teacher at Salem State, and in his poetry workshops, so much of his time was spent on titles. He really considered that a part of the poem, and it, of course it is. So we really had to work hard on the titles. He didn't let that stuff slide. Um, so, uh, you know, I end up with these much shorter titles and much more modest titles, like I have a story called Reduction, which was at one point this huge title, and um, Late Thaw came about much later after the story was done, and I was, and I just wasn't happy with the title. It might have been called Do Thinks These Things. And, um, I know, it would have seemed better, I think, now, in a weird way. I think they thought it was a little too metaphoric, and I have to explain it to people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, and I guess sometimes in a weird way, it's like, you know, really, I'm being sincere when I look back, I think I'm not, you know, I sort of even second guess myself at this point. Titles are hard for me. Um, and I think, I think I hit that one a little too hard, actually. You know, as I was just saying to this question, I, I think, you know, I wanted him to seem like he was thawing and that the frozen turkey was a symbol. And, you know, I mean, it's, so yeah, I need questions like that to keep me honest, actually. Um, any, any other thoughts, comments, criticisms? Yeah. You're talking about your process in the first question. So, you know, you're spending time writing every day a certain um, number of pages. So, once you're doing that and something comes to you through this writing and you feel like, hmm, this, yeah. what is it that draws you through, you know, several pages of writing that way? What draws you and, and tells you? Okay, this is the story I'm going to, to do through 
That's a good question. It's a good question. And I'm not just saying it. it's a good question for me because at this point now, like part of my job is to publish. And so it's not as easy as it was for me when I was younger when I would happen upon large swaths of time where I could work. And um, <clears throat> um, so there's a part of me, and so, you know, I end up going not only to, to literature to inspire me and instruct me, but also to books by writers. So I, I teach a course in, in fiction at the New School, which is solely on craft and theory. It's not a workshop. Um, we read stories. We often read stories by, by writers who write about fiction and the process. So we'll read stories by Andre Debuse, and he has an essay about writing a particular story, and Flannery O'Connor, who, who, who talks about writing uh, good country people. and. Um, and, and many, many others. And um, the, 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 the effort to think of it as a craft, I know this can be problematic, but and not a kind of romantic indulgence or like, I, you know, I'm inspired, and if I'm not inspired, I'm going to take it off for the day. So I have to write every day, or I have to at least produce enough to keep writing. And some days I don't feel like it. So the question about when do you know it's there, and when do you feel like you can pursue it is a really good one. Because you want to publish. At some point, you want to you want to put it out there. I do, and I also don't want to put out something that I'm not proud of. But all that stuff doesn't really matter. I have to kind of be involved with. It. So I think you know, just sort of to repeat some of the things I've been saying. At some point, I feel like it clicks. But there's a while when I have to say the story feels like you know that I'm almost experiencing it now. That moment when you hear your voice on a tape recorder, and you're like, I can't believe I sound like that. And for, for many, many weeks, I'll be reading stories and think it's got that thing where it doesn't sound like my voice, I don't recognize it, and then I'm embarrassed by it. I don't, I don't want, you know, I, you know, when you hear your, for me, I'll turn that tape recorder off. I don't want people to hear it, sincerely. And um, that's sort of the feeling I have sometimes. I don't want to show it to anybody. And, but then it does reach a point. In fact, I, late thought, I think, was something I showed you in, in an early draft. I, once, once I sort of got it, and I knew I, and I liked it, so I think part of it is feeling confident that I've found something that I can work on. Because in the beginning, I don't know what I'm working on, sincerely. I just don't know what I'm going to end up with. And that's a, I want to say it's a scary process, but really it's a pain in the ass, because you still have to continue kind of carving and chipping at it and building it. And so I think once I feel I've, I've mastered some of the style and some of the issues I need there, if it's story or character or voice, <clears throat> and then once I feel like I'm, I want to show it to someone, I think that's when I start to get my own steam behind it and can continue on. But so there's a little bit of courage. I'm not courage. But there's a little bit of uh, just stay in the chairness of it, you know, and not worry about where it's going. Or, um, and then it gets, and then when I think it's starting to get ready to show somebody or to bring it out to the world, then I actually feel like I want to get back to the desk and work on it. And I want to get it done so I can get it out there. So I think that's sort of it. Yeah. They're coming to kick me out. There's another class coming in now, right? Yeah. I, why don't you uh, ask it? Let me, let me add a little to it. The question is, Joe, yeah. what advice do you have for young writers that are just starting? I always ask that. <laughs> um, but I, I would add a little bit to that question. Please. Because um, I know some folks in the room are writers mm. and aspire to keep writing, and others just aspire sort of on their own academic path. Mm -hmm. And one thing that um, I know about you that other folks might not know is that you are just an incredible student <laughs> if Joe needs to know about something, you basically give him a kernel, he disappears in a room for a couple days and emerges, and now he's like a subject. Actor. <laughs> um, probably not a big surprise when you read the fiction because you need that element of um, deep understanding to get at some of the details that you get. Yeah. But um, I think there's probably advice there, not just for writers, but for students of any kind that you might be able to. Wow, I mean, that's, that's one of those questions that's so good, you almost feel like you are inadequate to answer it well. Um, the, let me just say one thing about that that immersion and research thing. You know, when uh, when when we were in the program at, at Salem, I was on this thing called the Writers Series Committee, something like that, and we were bringing writers in, and a lot of the writers were local poets and local fiction writers. But um, I was really into Richard Price at the time, who a lot of people think of as kind of a suspense writer, and he wrote for The Wire. But if you look at, you know, particularly his new book Lush Life, you really see that he's really a style writer, kind of like in the spirit of uh, Elmore Leonard and stuff. So 
Price came to Salem State and I picked him at the airport and we went around, but we were talking about the research he used to do to write books like Clockers and he would do ride arounds with cops. And I was like, so why do you do this? And you know, what's the, can't you just make it up and you know, read the paper? And um, he said, I don't, you know, he said, I need to get enough in my mind um, because I, you know, I don't know what details, if I go looking for the details, they may not kind of make their imprint on me, but I need enough so that I can lie convincingly. That's what he said. And I kind of love that because I don't know, I didn't know a lot about math, let's say, but I wanted to get some stuff. I'm not saying I convinced anybody, but I wanted to have enough so I could use it to the way I wanted to use it. Um, but in terms of, um, you know, advice for young writers, whether you want to be create a creative writer or whether you're, you're slaving away on your papers for class, I mean, I, I, I think if you're sincerely trying to figure out what it means to write, complete a paper for class or to, to, to finish a, a creative project, what I've been saying, I, I, I swear to you, has been, for me, the life-changing lesson, which is that um, it, 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 it's, it's, it's incredible what happens after about three months of doing it every day or doing it regularly. It seems strange and impossible to imagine, but what I know now from experience is that you will have a lot of words on a lot of pieces of paper, and you can work with that. And sometimes the anxiety of actually sitting down and trying to do that, for me, was a little paralyzing when I was younger. It, it was a lot of, like, you know, one of the things I was going to say about these um, writers whose books I teach is Stephen King, his book on, on writing, he talks a lot about the process. He talks even about, believe it or not, like knowing a little bit of grammar, that even just being able to know what you're doing in a sentence can help you kind of do it a little bit better. But, you know, he talks a lot about writing every day. And I take that lesson very seriously. I think that for, for young writers, whether it's academic work or creative work, um, you know, because I teach classes in literature and cultural studies, getting started early for students, I think, is an important thing, whether it's a creative writing workshop or an academic classroom. It sounds kind of conservative and boring. I've heard better writers say better things, but I think that for me, it's that regular process that has made a lot of the difference for me. I don't think I would have had a book had I not figured out how to sit down every day, because if I just, you know, waited for the muse, it, it you know, it doesn't show up a lot, so. That's been my experience, yeah. I mean, I love that question because I actually, I'm kind of, I feel kind of, I, I like the idea of free writing. It has never worked for me. And I've had instructors and I've, you know, I've actually been on panels with Peter Elbow and I've like, I've read his books and I know about free write and stuff. I've used it. Um, it doesn't work for me. I end up doing that thing like I am free writing, I am free writing, I am free writing. Um, seriously, don't stop writing. It, um, I, as I was saying to Tyrone, you know, I think, I, no, I do, I think, I want something to come out of the, the word count that I'm trying to do that day. I want something to happen. That's why I was saying the blank page is really difficult because you want to put something there. So if so one of the things I do is I keep like a writer's journal, I keep a journal, and if there's some advertisement I see, some language, some idea, something I've overheard, I might just use that as a prompt rather than free write. Free write just seems too blank pagey for me. So yeah, I think pulling from your from observations or things that you're able to remember that might be interesting to you, maybe trust that that's going to be something that'll get you going. Um, I want to, if, if you don't mind, I want to leave some time for Joe to sure. be outside. He has some copies of his book um, that he can sign or, or uh, can purchase. And um, <clears throat> I also want to uh, thank you for coming here. And I have a bag of mysterious. <laughs> I love it. Oh my God. I love it. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for uh, speaking to us. It's great. We have some honor students in here. We have some English uh, lit students. Uh, um, some students have looked at your work through sort of a postmodern lens. Sure, sure. And then you just have students that are just starting out look, thinking of themselves as literary scholars and looking at these uh, wonderful stories that experiment with form and content, and it's just been a real treat for us to have a living writer <laughs> who's just published this book, so it's a real treat for us, so we're grateful for you. My pleasure, thank you very much, folks.